Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz saxophonist Tim Warfield. His latest album was 2015 Spherical, and there is many more on the horizon in 2017. He was born in York, Pennsylvania, and went on to Howard University in Washington, D.C. for two years. From there, he led and co-led groups in central Pennsylvania and the Baltimore, Washington areas before playing with big shots like Donald Byrd, Christian McBride, Dizzy Gillespie, Isaac Hayes, Jimmy Smith, and the great Kenny Barron. He has plenty of jazz mileage and stories to behold, so get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Tim, thank you for taking a minute out today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I'm going to go ahead and dive in right here and kind of get an idea of what's been going on with you lately. Your last album, 2015 Spherical, um, it's been out for several years. Is there any new albums on the horizon? Not documented yet. Um, currently, I have a habit of, I actually like to try out material before I record it. I like to try it on audiences. I have the luxury to be able to do so. And um, I just think it's a good idea for two reasons. The first reason is it gives you a it gives you a, a gauge in terms of being able to tell what the audience responds to and what they don't. The other thing is if they actually like the music and they've heard it a couple of times, it actually gives them something to look forward to so it actually helps with sales. So currently, I've been, um, uh, I realized I hadn't done a recording with my organ band in quite some time. I'm hoping to do something at the end of the year with them. I'm I'm torn between about three concepts, so I'm I'm trying them out. I've been trying them out on audiences. So the organ band has been working quite a bit. Other than that, I have actually, believe it or not, I, I'm I'm one of those people in, who believe in having projects done in advance. So though the organ band music is still a work in process, the sextet that I use, and that's like my probably the oldest. Ag, uh, aggregation I've worked with as they were on, minus the Stefan Harris who didn't make it until my second record, they've been on most of my <clears throat> acoustic recordings. Uh, I have music already done for whenever we decide to go into the studio. The music is finished for them. I also have uh, a, um, a ballad project that I'm, I'm pretty much finished with the music. I just need to go into the studio. And I have a couple of other things like that that are on my list uh, to do. But there is no specific, uh, there's nothing in the can waiting to come out at this time. Okay. All right. So answer me this. How, how does it, how does it, as a kid from York, Pennsylvania, grow up to become a professional jazz musician? How did this happen? I ask myself that every day. <laughs> uh, you look up to your parents, you know, when you're young. Both my mother and father are, are big jazz enthusiasts. I grew up listening to jazz. I make jokes that I probably started listening to jazz while still in the womb. Huh. And when I and while I was growing up, that really, in all honesty, was the music I thought that was prominent because that's what was played so much in the household. There were some other things like classical music and some gospel and um, some blues as well as a little bit of R&B. But for the most part, I heard jazz. And the only other music I heard, in all honesty, was pop music. Stuff by Barry Manilow. You know, Burt Bacharach was still very popular at that time. Some of his music was being played. Uh, the Carpenters, and that's some speaking 70s and into the 80s. That's the stuff that I knew, because that's what was on the radio in the car when I would be with my parents. But I'd, I'd listen to the music, by the time I got to be uh, a teenager, there was a very, very big jazz scene in central Pennsylvania that I was uh, uh, privy to as a kid with very generous musicians who uh, spent time showing me things, call, even calling me for gigs. So we just moved on from there once I got involved uh, in the idea, I got a chance to see a bunch of musicians that came through, like Dexter Gordon. Uh, Johnny Griffin was probably the first concert I ever saw. The second 
being Ira Sullivan, and then Dexter Gordon. And when I saw Dexter Gordon, I was done. I was like, this is the coolest man I've ever seen in my life, and I want to play like him. And uh, I started to pursue it after that. Was it always music for you? Was that your dream, or was there any other, any other backup plan for you? <clears throat> oh, there was. Music wasn't actually a part of the program. I noticed I said I wanted to play like him. I didn't necessarily want to make a living like him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually um, I was involved in three disciplines though I didn't know it at the time. The first in my, I say it's the first because it was the one that I started to do even before music, and it was like my true love, which was visual art. And I was told that I had a pretty strong learning acumen towards uh, at least uh, charcoal and chalk and pastel, though what deterred me was acrylic and watercolor. So, and I, I still have some of the uh, the uh, paintings I did, or, or drawings, rather, that I did um, at age 10 and 11 uh, when I was going to an art academy with all adults, which was the other thing, that sort of not being able to really communicate because everybody was so much older. They were supportive, but they were so much older, I just felt a disconnect. Um, the other was the martial arts, which I studied from the age of six until about the age of 14. And for whatever reason, my interest started to dwindle. Um, I had been in it for quite some time and had definitely made some strides and accomplishments. Uh, and around the same time, I was given an instrument. And as those interests started to dwindle, uh, the, the music started to... The, the, my interest in music and playing the saxophone uh, started to increase, uh, and maybe that's because uh, that was actually the last discipline that I was introduced to, so it was the newest, and maybe it's because my interest actually was increasing, which which is what made the other two dwindle. I don't know, yeah. but what I do know is I started to uh, really excel uh, in, in music and improvisation was something for me that I just thought that you did. So I went to school. Um, I went to Howard University um, already fairly proficient uh, uh, in music, uh, but I went for architecture and that's what I went to study. Um, my confusion was that the opportunity to be creative in the same way as these three other disciplines was there, just based off of the things I knew. I pretty much knew Frank Lloyd Wright, and I had a bunch of – I used to read these interior design books all the time and architectural digests. So it wasn't clear to me at the time that um, those type of opportunities are very special opportunities. And architecture is much more about math, which was not my forte. <laughs> so uh, I, I segued into music, and that's how that happened. So at Howard University, what did you learn about music? What did they teach you about jazz? Did you learn anything there about music formally in a formal environment? Yeah, but I, in all honesty, I was one of those. I just wasn't. I, I wasn't necessarily discovered like some some of the younger artists. Uh, that you've heard about that got discovered at 15 and 16 years old uh, or 13 and 14 years old even these days. Uh, but I was kind of already, not kind of, I was performing professionally at 16. It just wasn't internationally. I hadn't gone to New York yet. Um, but by the time I was 18, 19, I had already performed with James Williams and Donald Byrd. Uh, uh, so... I already had a lot of knowledge when I went to that school and I had it hands on from getting an opportunity to meet so many musicians and them being all of my friends were about 25 to 30 years older than me <laughs> because <laughs> my activities when I was a teenager were not your average teenager activities. I was going to jam sessions every weekend uh, with my father uh, who escorted me uh, for maybe a year until uh, he, he became familiar with the people 
And then a good friend of mine, uh, um, a drummer by the name of Mark Schwartzball, we used, he, had, he had this MG sports car, and we used to drive up to Harrisburg. He was a great, uh, he was a, a great drummer. Uh, he started to play again now. But we would drive up there every weekend and, and play. So when I was at Howard, I'm not saying that I didn't learn things because there was a lot of information to learn technical things. And I had some teachers show me some things. They taught me about the, the discipline of playing the instrument. But I had already had private instruction before I went to school. Uh, they also taught me about, you know, the mechanics of music. So I learned about uh, the mechanics of music uh, while I was at the school as well. What did you learn from people like Donald Byrd? I mean, you play with a lot of big shots over time. And what do you learn from the veterans? What do they teach you about not only music but life? The importance of tradition, which I think is sadly and very mistakenly even by authoritarians, taken for granted, um, which is a big mistake because the, the tradition is history. So you always find truth in history. We'd be surprised how often we're repeating ourselves if we understood and embraced tradition. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is to truly move forward in a logical manner. To, to to actually introduce something um, inherently different, then you must embrace the tradition. It's like trying to come up, you know, you hear about people all the time. Uh, you know, I haven't heard it as much lately, but at one point there were a lot of young people that were always saying, like, you know, we're doing our own thing. And I was like, who's we? <laughs> you, <laughs> in history, if you understand history, uh, uh, Schaumburg talks about this. Uh, you've always had one person who came up with an ingenious idea with many then following, right? And yeah. then those followers actually, they make a living based off of someone, based on someone else's idea until the next new idea comes and then they have to scramble to get to that idea. You would work on trying to evade that process unless you want that to be your existence if you really studied tradition and understood that. It's, it's like speaking a language. No one's coming up with a new language without having some foundation. We know where that comes from, the traditions that we have, like look, Sally, see, spot, run, which is real simple, but we all know, you know, fun with Dick and Jane. So I think one of the most important things I learned was the idea of tradition uh, and all the ideas that go along with the jazz tradition and understanding that there's no shame and reverence and how important that will be to you later in life. Absolutely. Well, and speaking of tradition and collaboration, it, it must be a joy to have collaborated with Christian McBride and, and Nicholas Payton. What's, what's it like to work with those guys? Oh, wow. It was a learning experience for sure. I learned a lot musically uh, playing with both of them. There were two different artistic concepts, uh, both very challenging. Uh, Christian McBride always wrote and still writes in very difficult keys, keys that are less frequently played. So um, I was forced to, to play in more uncomfortable keys while I was in his band. Um, He's also one of the most charismatic individuals I've ever had an opportunity to, to uh, stand on the stage or share the stage with. I learned a lot about how people relate to personality and how important uh, the complete picture of, 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 of presenting music is with Christian. And, of course, I've never been on a stage with any bass player who... I mean, I've literally, and I'm not making this up, I've been, uh, I've done performances where I've watched him get a standing ovation every song. Wow. After his solo. Like, people just jump up and start clapping after his solo. Uh, I vividly remember this uh, happening one time at Catalina Bar and Grill in Los Angeles. So that was great uh, for me. That was a great experience for me. 
And Nicholas Payton, that was another, whew, that was another experience that was extraordinary. Uh, the knowledge, understanding of tradition, as well as power that he uh, um, exemplified on his instrument at the time was unprecedented. And in all honesty, I have yet to hear that from anybody in the newer generations. Uh, he was a force to be reckoned with. Now, what's very interesting about Nicholas is that he didn't talk much when we played. Uh, we talked after, but we learned through example. He would bring music. It was our job to learn it. If he was unhappy about something or needed something, he would tell you. Otherwise, it was up to you to create. And when he stepped on the stage and started to play, <laughs> you knew what was next. Either you were going to pass or fail. Because that's what it felt like after following a solo that he took. It was that much energy, and his vision was just that acute. So uh, I learned a lot about uh, music uh, from him. Um, and he's very, very knowledgeable. He's way, way beyond his years. I used to talk to him about things he shouldn't have even known about. I was like, man, how do you know about uh, this TV series? Like I talked to him about Soundstage. I said, like, you might not have even been born. He said, oh, I know so-and-so that had such and such. And this is way before uh, the Internet. So what that means is one of two things. One, either someone was taking a lot of time to introduce him to a lot of information, or he was seeking it out. And I believe he was seeking it out, uh, which for me means something very specific. That's, that implies desire. And so you could hear that in his music. So it was, it was a great experience uh, sh sharing the stage with him. Uh, and being a part of his group, particularly for so long, as well as Christian. Both of them were amazing uh, to, to work with, and I'm very grateful for that, for the opportunity to play with both of them. So since the time you left Howard University and really went into the foray of jazz and developed your own career, you've had a very long career with a lot of cats, a lot of collaborations, albums, a lot of stages. How do you feel about your career? Where, what, where, right now, standing in this present time, how do you feel about what you've done? Oh, I'm very cool. <laughs> I'm very happy. I'm very happy with my career. I do, you know, I don't know. I pretty much do what I want to do when I want to do it. Now, I don't want to brag because that could change tomorrow. <laughs> but I, I can say that, I look, I I don't do all the gigs. Uh, people call me. I'm, sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do that gig. I don't do it. Though I try to play as much as possible. Of, of course, I'm doing some teaching now. Uh, at Temple University and Messiah College. I actually was reluctant when I first started, but the more I got involved and saw the challenge in it and watched other people who have really made teaching an art, the more, again, I realized that even that is a learning process that translates into what happens with you on the stage as you're constantly trying to explain things to students in a way that is uh, simple but acute. And that process of, of rethinking it then translates into how you play. Uh, I've always done recordings. You know, I've had somebody, they gave me a little criticism about staying with Criss Cross for so long. And I won't say that I haven't had some other opportunities to do some things with some other record companies because I definitely did. Some of them didn't, uh, many of them didn't come to fruition as we expected. But the bottom line was I was always happiest. This is about the art for me. So um, understanding what that means, uh, I'm not really interested in much tampering uh, with what I do at all. I'm not really interested, unless I'm in a rut and ask you, hey, what do you think I should do? I pretty much know what I want to do. Uh, and that goes all the way down to what I want my cover to look like, what I want the title to 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 say. Uh, my input in the liner notes. Uh, I've always had input in my liner notes, with the exception of maybe a few. I'll I'll write a synopsis of what the record is about and send it to somebody that's writing the liner notes. 
And then between an interview and what I've written, I know that there's going to be a great accuracy in what's going to be put on paper. And uh, there's only been a, a couple of writers that I've trusted enough not to do that. So um, I've always been able to present things, maybe with the exception of one record that I've done. Uh, uh, I've been able to present them uh, in a way that is true to who I am. Between that and the fact that, you know, I've, I've been doing this for so long and I've, I, I, I'm very happy with my career. I'm at a stage now where I do what I want to. That's what I want to do. And I want to try to do more things under my own name. You get to a certain age, that's something that you want to do. But I'm happy that I'm still being called by some of my peers as well as some younger people uh, uh, who have been calling me to be a part of their projects as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it, understanding that the real point of all of this is, uh, like I said, the art and the test of time. It's like, okay, 10 years from now, where are you? Are you still relevant? What type of records do you put out? Um, how do they sound in comparison to what you put out before? You know, the depth of what you're presenting, those sorts of ideas, I believe, happen in the test of time. And the test of time is really what tells the truth as to who you are as an artist. Speaking of the test in time, that's a perfect segue into my next question, which is this. Very simply put, why do you love jazz as a practitioner and one that's dedicated your life to it? Why do you love it? I'll say this, and rather bluntly, my connection to jazz is a result of the teaching that I've been given. For me, the belief that I have in the music is a different type of belief, I believe, than many as a result of it being a being very related to my heritage. I'm not saying that other people don't have a belief system in it, but it's very close. It has always been, and it's been taught to me from that perspective. So there's a direct tie between like jazz music, uh, R&B music, African music, as well as um, all the other musics that have influenced jazz. When I think about jazz, I go all the way back to the African drum and, and the things that I've been taught about it. So, uh, the reason why I love jazz is the nobility um, that, from a from a cultural standpoint, that it's been able to keep despite all of the trials and tribulations that go along with why the music exists in the first place. So for me, the fact that it can touch so many people, so many people love it, even when there's supposed what would I call it, trivial and uh, campy backlash, like the strange I hate jazz sort of articles that went on a couple of years ago. With, and, you know, the, the mock Sonny Rollins, which I thought was just a, in poor taste. Uh, um, this mock Sonny Rollins article that came out where he was like, he didn't like jazz or uh, something like that. Like, despite all of those things, jazz still ends up reigning as 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 something of the utmost importance. And again, it's a test of time issue. You know, if you buy periodicals or you collect older periodicals, which I have them, I believe, into like the 1950s, you see uh, a lot of the same things, a lot of the same questions, a lot of the same articles. I have a lot of his jazz dead articles, a lot of them. To ask the question, to continuously ask the question, uh, as years go by, as decades go by, uh, clearly tells you the answer. And all of those sorts of things, as well as um, what it's done for people around the world, uh, the influence of the music, I know it had a, a strong influence in other countries, is very important to me. It makes me it makes me happy that this music has been able to do that, and I'm I'm proud and actually very honored to be part of that legacy now. So let's go from the macro of jazz to the micro of you and ask you this. This is my final question for you. Everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, those that you play music for, those that pick up your music. But at the end of the day, or the beginning of the day, I should say, when you face the world, who do you think you are? I'm Tim Warfield, Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Real simple. 
Uh, I'm not defined by music. I'm not defined by jazz music. I had a personality before then. I could go into fashion design tomorrow like like it's nothing. I could, I'm very versed in that. I'm pretty knowledgeable in, in the culinary arts as well. I mean, I can do whatever I want to because I have a mind. So I'm not really defined by any of this. And though I sound serious because I am serious, I don't take it more seriously than I do life. Life is a completely different ball game than any genre of music. No. And genres genres of music, particularly art forms, can be a, a mirror of life. But that's very different than living life. So I'm just Tim and the rest doesn't matter. What people think, if they if they think I'm super great, that's cool. If they think I'm not great at all, that's cool. Uh because it's my past and like I said, if you read my credentials, I've done pretty well for myself. And I'm going to continue to work on trying to get that to continue. I want that to continue to happen. So I'm going to work on it until I choose not to, which is my prerogative. One of the things I was taught as a young person by my father, who uh, has always given me a lot of wisdom, he said, son, one of the things that you must work towards being is decisive. Always be decisive. He paused for a second. He said, understanding that you're always allowed to change your mind. So I'm Tim Warfield. Regardless, I don't need any labels. I'm a human being. I'm Tim Warfield. Man, I like that. That's a great way to kind of wrap everything up. Tim, thank you for opening up your world, your ideas on music and jazz, the thriving art form that we talk about. I appreciate it. Man, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure for sure. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Tim for his time and all of those stories and his honesty. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.